colleagues of mine, uh, Kelly Brownell, Dean of Public Policy at Duke, and Christina Roberto at University of Pennsylvania. They introduced uh, the idea of, uh, more popularly in the Lancet several years ago, strategic science. They defined strategic science as research designed to address gaps in knowledge important to policy decisions derived from the reciprocal flow of information between researchers and policymakers. And I would just make one uh, uh, correction to that or amendment to include in that community advocates and experts by experience. And they go on to say that strategic science is communicated not only in scholarly publications, but also in forms relevant to policymakers. And again, a minor amendment to include community advocates and experts by experience. Just critical, absolutely critical to be involved in this work of strategic science. And you're gonna see some examples of that in a little bit. So what I'd like to do now, just hold that thought about strategic science. I'm gonna walk you through our our economic study, the most comprehensive economic study of eating disorders in the United States, and then we'll come back to strategic science. So for this work, we collaborated with Deloitte Access Economics and with the Academy for Eating Disorders, uh, which is a global uh, professional society for eating disorders. Key takeaways from this report, eating disorders are common, they are deadly, and they are expensive. Nearly 30 million Americans alive today, or close to 9% of the US population, will have an eating disorder at some point during their lives, either in the past, present, future, some point in their lives. Nearly 2 million children alive today will have an eating disorder before they are 20 years old. Here are some of the key points from the study, and then I'm going to delve in more deeply to walk you through some of these costs. Eating disorders affect people from all groups, all corners of society, all communities, at all ages, starting as young as five and well over 80 years old, all race ethnicity groups. However, people of color with eating disorders are half as likely to receive a diagnosis or to receive treatment. And this has to do with breakdowns in our medical system where people are not uh, getting the access they need to care. All genders are affected. We know that females are around two times more likely to have an eating disorder than males. Most of this research is with cisgender females and males. We're starting to see more research showing higher rates in transgender and gender non-binary individuals also. So that's a growing area of research. All sexual orientation groups are affected. All body sizes are affected. We estimate that over 10,000 deaths per year result in the United States directly from an eating disorder. And that equates to one death every 52 minutes in this country directly attributable to an eating disorder. For our study, we use standard cost of illness modeling methods that have been used with many different kinds of conditions to estimate financial costs and reduction in well being. We use what's called a one year prevalence method. So the estimates I give you are for a single year. Uh, the late 2018 and early 2019, uh, the fiscal year spanning that period, one year, 12 months. And this note that this is before the pandemic. We know that eating disorders have gotten far worse during the pandemic. The study was completed just before the pandemic. We've started by going through the epidemiologic literature to get what's the latest data on prevalence, on mortality, on quality of life, which is critical for uh, estimating well being losses. We looked at the economic burden in five payer groups that's individuals, families and carers, government, society, and employers. And then we went through the, the steps of cost of illness modeling to uh, estimate costs for health, health systems, that's hospitalization, emergency department, primary care, outpatient, residential treatment, anything that's part of the health system. Uh, we also looked at pro productivity costs and businesses. Okay, we got the that. recording down. No problem. We got for productivity costs, we're looking at absences from work, reduced workforce participation, reduced productivity at work, premature mortality, and then caregiving, caregiving. And this, all of this information to help, we combine with information about years of healthy life loss due to other illnesses uh, or the consequences of an eating disorder and years of life loss due to premature death. 
some of the key findings around costs here on this slide, and I'll walk through these in more detail momentarily. We are estimating that close to $65 billion per year are lost in the US economy directly attributable to eating disorders. And this 65 billion each year can be broken down into several main categories, productivity losses. Again, this has to do with work and workplaces, uh, close to $49 billion, billion dollars lost because of the impact of eating disorders and the lack of care that we need for eating disorders. Informal care refers to family members, loved ones needing to care for someone with an eating disorder. Health system costs at four and a half billion dollars we're seeing because of eating disorders. Now, well-being is a concept that through these kinds of cost of illness analyses, uh, the concept of well-being tries to get more at the quality of life and how that's impacted by an illness. And the economists have come up with ways to monetize that. It, if you're not an economist or used to these methods, it can sound rather crass, but it is a commonly used metric quantifying in a, in a monetary way, the impact on quality of life. And the estimate there for eating disorders is well over $300 billion per year. And I'm gonna walk through a couple of other costs here and then we'll go into a little more depth. Cost to hospital systems. We're estimating close to 40, 54,000 emergency room visits or close to $30 million in cost for that, for emergency room visits. Close to 24,000 inpatient hospitalizations and that's totaling well over $200 million. Now, if you look to the right side, lower right side, you'll see losses per group estimated. Uh, over $23 billion as the tab picked up by individuals and families each year because of an eating disorder. Government and employers are not far behind with close to 18 billion, employers at over 16 billion, and then other costs to society over 7 billion. These are big figures here, and I'll do some comparisons a little bit later. So the next set of slides, I'm gonna offer a little more detail about these costs, and then we'll be stepping back to think about how does this report fit into the big picture? With uh, eating disorders in a single year, the prevalence estimate is uh, five and a half million Americans with an active eating disorder in the year that we're doing the analysis. So that's a lot of people in actively with an eating disorder. We'll notice here the, with the red circle, you'll see the breakdown of different eating disorders. Most people have are familiar with anorexia nervosa, bulimia, bulimia nervosa. Uh, those are the ones most talked about in the media, but they are not the majority of cases. The vast majority of eating disorders are either binge eating disorder or a catch-all category called other spe specified feeding and eating disorder, a terrible name, uh, and it is not any less serious. It's that people have a combination of symptoms, and that's how they end up in that. You can see the light blue part of the pie and the dark blue pie take up almost the whole uh, amount here because they're so much more common. Another thing I want to point out here, you see the age across the X axis there with a big spike over uh, the um, teens, 20s, 30s, up until the 40s. Nearly half of people with eating disorders are under 30, and that is an active eating disorder under 30. 83% are of working age. So this is going to come back. We're going to see this again when I talk about productivity costs. Now the financial costs of eating disorders are large and substantial reduction in well-being. The annual financial cost of eating disorders, as I mentioned, uh, nearly $65 billion per year. This equated to nearly $12,000 per person, individual with an eating disorder. I wanna call your attention to the lower left part of the screen. Financial costs for types of eating disorders as I mentioned, people tend to have heard of anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa. They, they do take up a, uh, a, about a third of the cost, but it's actually these much more common disorders, the binge eating disorder and other specified feeding or eating disorder that is the combination of symptoms that's not any one other disorder. These make up the vast majority of costs. That's something that few policymakers are aware of. And that's 30 over a third is in that so-called catch-all category. Health system costs, the majority are coming from primary care and outpatient care, where we have health systems cost is just one piece of the impact of this condition on the economy, the four and a half billion dollars or over 800 per person with an eating disorder. And here the light blue takes up the most, uh, largest part of the pie 
uh, that's for primary care and outpatient because people need to be interfacing with the medical or mental health system to get the care they need for recovery. And that's making up the largest portion there. Productivity costs. Now, a reminder, this has to do with workplace, people being able to work or not being able to work either because of their own eating disorder or caring for a family member. The estimate on the productivity costs is clear, like nearly $49 billion out of the total of $65 billion, and that's in a single year, cost of the economy, or close to $9,000 per person in productivity losses. Now with this, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa are very serious conditions. And when people are actively experiencing these conditions, the estimate is they miss, may be missing work for an additional over 27 days per year compared to someone who does not have these conditions. For the other eating disorders, not quite as debilitating or people may miss an additional four days of work. Now, down at the bottom right of the screen, you'll see productivity costs of eating disorders. Those are fairly evenly spread out across individuals, employers, and government, each picking up around a third, give or take. Other financial costs, I mentioned informal care. That's, an, that's the way economists refer to the care that family members or loved ones provide for a, a loved one who is struggling with an eating disorder. And it's a vital backup to where our health system often has dropped the ball and not offering the care that people need. We are estimating that in what's called informal care uh, is coming out to about six and a half billion dollars per year for eating disorders. And I wanna note here, some of that is time uh, that's in addition to work where on close to six full-time working weeks per year are devoted by caregivers to a loved one with an eating disorder. We want families to be involved, but we also want our healthcare system to be really helping them uh, and picking up much more of the care than the health system is currently doing. I just have a couple more slides like this, and then we're gonna take a step out. So who bears the cost? Total financial costs borne by individuals with eating disorders and their loved ones, we estimate at $23.5 billion. So this is out-of-pocket payments. This is over $23 billion out of people's pockets because the healthcare system has let them down and is not covering the full care that they need. Now, finally, with well-being costs, this is a, a concept that economists have developed for cost of illness kinds of studies to be able to make comparisons across, across uh, communities, across countries, across conditions. Well-being costs with eating disorders are, are high, very high. You get, some of you may be familiar with the term disability adjusted life years. If, you, if you've heard it before, it's a very common metric used in the cost of illness studies and in economics. The estimate at 1.3 billion dailies or disability adjusted life, life, life years is what's been estimated for eating disorders. If you haven't studied dailies, just file that away. And at some point when you've had a chance to learn more about dailies and qualies, you'll, uh, this will make a little bit more sense. But what is crystal clear is that eating disorders account for 1.2% of the total burden of disease in the United States. Eating disorders, which is something that few people are very educated about, Medical schools do not teach doctors about this. Nursing schools do not teach nurses uh, about how to address it. And yet it's over 1% of the total burden of disease in the US is attributable each year to eating disorders. Loss of well-being, when monetized this, had, we're putting the figure at 326 plus billion dollars per year or nearly $60,000 per person. And that has to do with decrements or reductions in quality of life. Okay, now the comparison to other conditions that you probably be more familiar with, Parkinson's disease, very similar methods used by other researchers for cost of illness. Parkinson's disease, placing it at about $54 billion in 2019 in the US attributable to Parkinson's disease, something that we clearly know is a very high public health priority, actually is coming up as less of a cost to the US economy than eating disorders. Schizophrenia one of the most serious medical uh, mental health conditions that we have uh, the ranges from a multiple study somewhere between 27.6 billion per year and 111 billion per year in 2019 us dollars you'll you'll see that eating disorders at 65 billion comes right down in the middle 
of that range that we see for schizophrenia. There's several implications I want to highlight. Uh, this study, our study, is the most comprehensive study of eating disorders, uh, the economic and social impact of eating disorders in the United States. Um, the, it, this kind of research is critical for informing resource allocation, for research, for treatment, prevention. And this study, as the most comprehensive, really is giving us a leap forward in the field, in the country, and in health resources allocation to really fully understand the depth and breadth of impact of eating disorders. I'll highlight a few areas of research we need, and maybe some of you will end up leading some of this research down the road. We need more research looking at cost effectiveness of treatment and prevention options to reduce the cost of eating disorders in US society. Further research is needed to understand the additional costs and it, with eating disorders that can be attributable to structural racism and other structural oppressions that keep people from getting the care they need or may even be increasing their risk of developing an eating disorder in the first place. We need more research on cost effectiveness of different models of care, step care, integrated care models. There's a variety of models. Some are more efficient and more effective than others. We need more research on long-term impacts of eating disorders. Our study, as I mentioned right at the up front, is focused on a single year. That's cost and social burden in a single year. But of course, over the lifetime, the consequences of an eating disorder can add up for a person. We need a lot more work on that. And one more area I want to highlight is a need to undertake research to estimate the cost that could be saved by preventing eating disorders through early intervention and uh, early screening and identity identifying uh, eating disorders before someone has had the condition for quite a long time. Okay, take a breath there. If I were in the room with you, I might ask to see if there's questions now, but I know with, uh, online, I should probably just keep moving forward. Uh, what I wanna do now, we see a lot of numbers, all of those numbers are captured on our website at the report and I'll show you how you can access the report in your spare time. You can look up the report and see the figures there, uh, review some of this. I wanted to give you more of a sense of the impact of eating disorders, uh, how it compares to other conditions, but I don't expect you to remember all those numbers, it's not necessary, but getting the sense of how serious they are is an important point. They are common, they're expensive, and they're deadly. If that's all you remember, that's what you need to know about eating disorders. You can always refer back to our report free and available on our website. So now let's take a, a step back for the bigger picture. How does this report that we published last year fit into the bigger picture of policy change and evidence generating evidence-based policy? So this economic impact report that I just walked you through in detail is, is a great case example, I would say, of strategic science to advance policy action, in this case for eating disorders. But the, what are the principles of strategic science that I will walk through now can be applied in any domain. So other issues that may be the most serious, the important issues to you that you care about most, these principles could apply in that situation just as well. I'm gonna walk you through the rationale for the report, the approach we use, amplification and policy translation, how we how we folded all of that into our work around the report. So the rationale, in the past decade, three major national eating disorders cost of illness reports have been released globally. From Australia, they were ahead of anyone else almost 10 years ago and then uh, seven years, six years ago, Australia's Butterfly Foundation, now this is a nonprofit community organization in, in Australia, they contracted with Deloitte Access Economics, same company that we then worked with, to publish reports costing eating disorders for Australia. First report of its kind ever. And then uh, in about seven years, six years ago, the UK, the, another uh, community-based nonprofit organization or charity as they call it over there, BEAT is the name of the organization. They contracted with Price Waterhouse to do a similar report just for the UK. Butterfly has gotten, that, that foundation has gotten the furthest and they have had spectacular achievements in leveraging their reports to in, and doing some subsequent strategically targeted surveys. So we're in Australia now, I'm talking about Australia. After publishing both of their cost of illness 
reports, first of the kind, they then contracted to do a survey of the experiences of people with eating disorders and their family members and how they lived that, the, the economic, the lack of coverage for healthcare in Australia, the barriers to care, the costs, how was that experienced personally by people with eating disorders? They did a, a very compelling report um, through a survey to describe that. And with that, and with very smartly targeted policy advocacy, they got over $10 million in funding toward treatment in Australia, $10 million, $110 million goes much further than in the US. This was a major transformative change in health policy in Australia to uh, vastly increase access to care for Australians with eating disorder. We saw that in the news several years ago in 2018, and we thought we had to follow their lead here in the US. They figured it out, we got to figure it out. It's never been done in the US, but we need to know the same kind of answers that they got in Australia. So what we did, uh, and I'm talking when I say we, I mean a partnership between my organization, Striped, and the Academy for Eating Disorders, which is the leading global professional society for eating disorders, researchers, and uh, clinicians. So we contacted the same Deloitte Access Economics team who had worked with the Australian group and said, well, can you work with the US? Uh, do you know how to do this kind of work here? And they said, yeah, sure, we're very interested. So we set up a partnership and then Striped had the funds to hire Deloitte to work with us in collaboration. Their team is, they do cost of illness studies all day, every day. This is what they specialize in. So they were uniquely suited to do this work with us. And the, what one of the things we were trying to, to achieve, I'm gonna flag this for you, is a cross-sector collaboration. This was not something coming just out of the ivory tower. We had Deloitte Access Economics, technical uh, experts who were from the business sector, Striped Academic Research Center based at Harvard School of Public Health, and then the Academy for Eating Disorders brought in the clinical perspective. It's the Global Professional Society for Eating Disorders Clinicians. Now, with this cross-sector collaboration, we felt like we would be really well positioned to then eventually get our message out when we were done, um, and I'll come to that shortly. We put together an advisory panel of experts. Again, we wanted to have this advisory panel be cross-sector. As much as I love the Ivory Tower, I'm working at Harvard, I've been uh, doing research here for a couple of decades. There's so much good work here, but our research cannot translate itself. We have to be working across sectors. And that's where with this team, we put together uh, technical expert, experts and experts uh, with community experience. So our panel experts included academics like myself, community members, people from the business world and people working closely with government. We also had panel members with expertise in health economics, in medicine, in policymaking, epidemiology, decision sciences, psychology and experts by experience, which is if you're not familiar with that term, it's a term commonly used by uh, communities of folks who have experienced, whether it's a mental health condition or a physical health condition or something else happening in the world, they have a unique expertise of having lived what happens when something, this condition, when someone experiences this condition, or it could be about climate change or something else, but experts by experience have a unique voice. So that what I'm talking about now with the big picture is we got these findings, we had the report, we could publish them in an academic journal, but we didn't want to stop there. We wanted this work to be translated and communicated in a way that policymakers would be able to work with it and that it would get a large audience. So we've really focused on amplification. This is after all the technical work was done. We wanted to amplify the findings. And here's another important point when you're working across sectors or across organizations, we wanted to have a unified voice. Because if you have a dozen different organizations, they might all have a different message and then nothing really gets through. We wanted to coordinate a unified voice. So with the report released, we, we planned a press conference and we timed it, the report release with the International Conference on Eating Disorders. That was last June. This is the biggest conference in the field of eating disorders globally. We wanted the release to be there so everyone there would be aware of the report having been released. And we had a community member, community leader and expert by experience moderate this. So normally an academic release of results uh, of a study, everybody on the panel would be an academic. 
and everything would be communicated in a way that only academics who specialize in that field would understand. We didn't want to do that because it was all about figuring out what, how do we translate this? We had an expert by experience, Joanna Kandel, moderate that session. It helped for our appeal outside of the ivory tower. We did Facebook live interviews with a few different organizations. And the goal is to communicate with community advocates who I'll get to this in a moment, critical for policy advocacy work, critical for being effective with policymakers is to have community members that's expert by experience and constituents have to be involved. So we wanted to communicate with them in a way that it would resonate with their lived experience and that they could make sure they can understand the key findings without having to be economists themselves. So part of the amplification effort, we coordinated with a dozen major eating disorders organizations in the US so that we could amplify in unison with a single shared infographic and shared social media. So all the, on the bottom part of the screen, you'll see many organizations uh, that are the major eating disorders organizations in the US. We collaborated with all of them. They all got on board with this unified voice because they all saw the value of an, the most comprehensive economic study uh, for the US. We were able to do this with the key findings, and I'll show you a, a screenshot of the, the infographic in a moment. And this, as I mentioned, is to ensure that report findings would be integrated into their own communications, because we gave them the tools to do that uh, with all the, the federal advocacy or state level advocacy that they do. So here's a, a, a shot of the one page, one pager infographic that we created. The, you saw little pieces of this earlier in my talk, and this is available for free on our website uh, for anyone who wants this. It, it tells the story of our findings in a way that most anyone could understand, educated lay readers, policymakers, scientists in other fields that they don't specialize in this. Uh, everyone could understand the key findings here. One page infographic had all the partner organizations logos, something you'll know if you've been in collaborations and coalitions Everyone who wants to make sure they get their own visibility. Uh, and we created social media assets. So we had a week, a week long schedule. We gave them the, the social media assets to use to push out through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So we created all that. We didn't do it alone. We don't all go, we don't go to uh, get our scientific training and then get all that too. We hired Capitol Hill based uh, in Washington, DC, government relations firm and a communications firm to help us do that. Um, and a key um, opportunity they created for us is to get an op-ed place, an op-ed place in the Hill. The Hill is the daily news source that's most widely read by federal policymakers. Uh, you may not have read it yet, but if you look it up, the Hill, every day they come out with, with op-eds and news stories about what's Washington doing? What are some of the federal issues? What's the new research that should be informing um, what's done in, in Congress or in the administration. We got an op-ed place there last June. The goal was to get our key findings communicated in a way where the policymakers will be looking. As I mentioned uh, one of the ideas with strategic science is that we don't expect policymakers to read our academic journals. We will communicate in a way where they read uh, about research and uh, make sure it's accessible to them. I want to note, this was last June a year ago. Uh, we had to use COVID as a hook. So we brought in a COVID angle and then we're able to communicate our op-ed that way. Key findings and policy actions, we laid it out very clearly for policymakers. Begin systematic national surveillance of eating disorders. You know how the, the government will collect, we have lots of public health surveillance tools as they call it, or surveys, collecting data on how many people are smoking or have they quit? Do they wear their seat belt? Are they eating fruits and vegetables? All these kinds of things, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention collects now, well, they don't collect anything about eating disorders. Even though eating disorders are among the most deadly of any mental health condition, the CDC is not collecting data on eating disorders. We want that to change. Also increase in research funding and correcting insurance gaps. I talked about how families are having to cover a lot of the gaps because the healthcare system is not providing the care. That some of that is due to gaps in insurance coverage where eating disorders are just uh, written out that they won't be covered sometimes, it depends on the insurance plan. Part of our translation efforts is with policymakers and to get these meetings so the government relation for, relations firm set, us, set up meetings for us. 
we worked with a, a firm called Center Road Solutions. We got meetings with National Institute of Mental Health, the US Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Education and more, CDC. Lots of meetings they set up so we could go um, in smaller group settings, answer their questions, share the results, talk about what they could do. This is all part of the proactive policy translation, research to policy translation process. We discuss our key findings, options for policy actions in these meetings. And we need the we need the members of government that work at CDC or elsewhere to be part of these meetings because they know better than we do on what of their programs could be changed, added, dropped, revised. They know better, but they need the original information and the motivation to do that. And this allowed us also to leverage the influence of other major non-eating disorders coalitions on Capitol Hill to help reinforce our message. So this is a team effort for sure. I'm gonna give you a few concluding thoughts on bringing strategic science together with eating disorders, our eating disorders economic report and the research. And then I'll have an epilogue where I'll talk a little bit more about our collaboration with ISL. So a few concluding thoughts. We made critical steps forward toward more fully understanding the social and economic burden of eating disorders in the United States. In addition, these new data are allowing us now to estimate cost effectiveness, improve quality of life, and most importantly, lives to be saved through scaling up effective prevention and early detection and treatment. We were able to pull all of these key messages out through our comprehensive economic report. Now, from a strategic science yeah. perspective, our top priority for undertaking the, the, this impact report was to engage decision makers in US government, in the healthcare sector and other sectors to motivate them to take action. So they, they had long said, oh, we don't have the data. We don't know anything about the cost. We gave them that, but we didn't just give them the cost, the economic results. We also built a whole um, uh, strategy around the amplification, communication, working with community members and getting their stories out there. U.S. policymakers have the evidentiary base now. It's part of what strategic science does. Compelling evidence, $65 billion lost annually to the economy due to eating disorders. That's one life lost every 52 minutes. And the escalating mental health crisis during COVID-19 has just further worsened eating disorders. We're seeing doubling, tripling the number of people coming into hospitals across the country needing treatment for eating disorders. And that's due to all of the, the, the very tragic effects of this pandemic. Responsibility really for all of us. And I'm speaking, speaking to other scientists who work in eating disorders or community advocates who work in this area is to use these methods of strategic science to motivate policymakers to act. And we know the lives depending on us can't afford to wait. They can't wait the time it takes for academics to publish another uh, hundred studies on this. What we need is for policymakers to be engaged and to act. So with that, I wanna to move to the epilogue about how do we try to get policymakers to act? They're busy, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues coming at them. Eating disorders is one, but there's many others. And we know that as state legislatures, they may have a thousand or thousands of bills that are introduced in big states every year. That's a lot of competition for their attention. But we also know that it's only when researchers, community members can organize, work together across uh, stakeholder groups across sectors to get an audience with policymakers. That's how we move them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our collaboration, our policy translation in action right now. This is from the field right now, the collaboration between Striped, my program, and the International Socioeconomics Laboratory, or ISL. Uh, I talk about some of the work before we started collaborating with uh, ISL in this article. It's a QR code. You could take a picture of that if you want, or we can share it later. It's an article, free access to the Harvard Public Health Review. Odds, arcs, and policy change, a step-by-step -step look at our public health campaign on how we took on the issues. And specifically, it's about diet pills, which is one small facet of eating disorders. Um, and then more recently, we started working with ISL and it's really taken off since then. So I'll just give you a few words around these products. Um, you may see them at any grocery store, in a corner store like a 7-Eleven, you'll see them sold in gyms, in GNC and health food stores. 
Uh, they are over-the-counter products sold for weight loss or shorthand is, is uh, diet pills or the products sold for muscle building. I'm folding that in here because it also the sale of the weight loss supplements and the muscle building supplements both prey on body image issues for, for young people, especially or people of all ages. So that's why we bring them together. They, these products though, even though they're available anywhere, including at your trusted pharmacy, they lack medical evidence to support their use. And they have been linked with eating disorders and steroid abuse. They can cause a wide range of health problems, some life-threatening in fact, and I'm not overstating that. These kinds of products are so poorly regulated right now that they have been found again and again to be laced with illegal ingredients, prescription meds, anabolic steroids, excessive stimulants, sometimes heavy metals show up in these products. They're so weakly regulated that this is going on right now. If you went down to the store and bought some right now, sent it to a lab, who knows what you're gonna find in it. Probably not what's on the package and potentially some of these illegal prescription meds tainting the product. Now they also worsen health inequities. And I'm gonna tell, tell you a little bit more about that. These products are deceptively marketed. They tend to not be too expensive and the deceptive marketing is targeting communities of color and low income communities and certainly targeting by gender. Uh, we find that um, uh, for weight loss supplements in particular in African-American communities and Latinx communities, we see much higher rates of use than in white communities. And there is targeted deceptive marketing to these communities. We know in, in households, the lower income households have higher rates of use. In research with cisgender men and women, we see women having twice the risk of using these products as men, especially the weight loss ones. Here on the, on the muscle building side, we see them more often used in men than women. And as I mentioned early on, we know there's higher rates in transgender and gender non-binary communities too. Education is a factor. And then in the most recent research that our group is doing on use of these products during the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing a three times more likely the use by African-Americans than, than white, uh, consumers, no doubt because of the predatory targeted marketing and deceptive marketing of these dangerous products. We have this up on our website. You can take a picture of that QR code uh, or we can share it with you later. So a few more slides and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, now this is part of our collaboration with ISL and also with lawmakers. So we have partnerships with ISL, with youth groups around the country and with lawmakers in a number of states to be able to share with them, get their attention, the lawmakers and talk to them about what we need them to do. We're advising them on, uh, together, we are coming up with advice on legislation, amendments to satisfy diverse stakeholders. Now it's very important that constituents be part of this, whether, and that's youth are very powerful voice in this issue. But no matter what kind of policy work you're doing, you want to have constituents of the lawmakers be part of it, community organizations and people with lived experience. Now, here's a point. If you, you, I gave you three other points about eating disorders. I want you to remember, remember this one too. It is human nature. Constituent stories always are more moving and motivating than data. Now, that doesn't mean data is not important, but it does mean to get movement by policymakers, we've got to have the stories that, that lived experience communicated. Evidence can and should inform policy, but it is stories, human stories that can motivate policy change. And it's just human nature, it's human nature. It's the same for us as scientists. We're moved more by stories and data, but we also know how to read data. We gotta have them both, the data from researchers and the stories from constituents and people with lived experience. So we've been, to make it really concrete, we've been working with lawmakers in Massachusetts, also New York, as Ryan mentioned, in California and we're looking in other places to get a bill introduced to ban the sale of those products I mentioned, the over-the-counter diet pills and muscle building supplements, ban the sale to minors. The products are so dangerous, they're not medically recommended. It's a common sense place to start. So we've been working with Representative Kaycon in Massachusetts and, and Senator Mike Rush in Massachusetts to move this legislation forward. It's still legislation, not law yet, uh, but we're, we're, there's a lot of movement happening now, and there's a way for you to get involved. And ISL has uh, created just an incredible opportunities for young people, whether it's Massachusetts, you're in New York, California, New Jersey now, or other states, you can get involved in this policy translation in action 
through ISL. I have two slides here, both have QR codes. You could take a picture uh, to get the URL or the QR code. This one is to a youth survey to tell us what you think about having these products preying on young people. If you're interested, take a picture, you could check out the youth survey led by ISL and a youth support letter. If this is an issue you care about and you want to sign on, you can see the youth support letter. You can take a picture of the QR here uh, and, and that the letter is for those who care about this issue and want to get, um, want to have your voice heard by lawmakers. It's a youth sign on letter for youth anywhere in the country. So I just covered a lot. I'm going to stop there and see if we might have some questions for the next few minutes until the hour is up. Thank you for listening. And thank you also to folks who interrupted me early on to make sure I had my screen set up properly. I really appreciate that you did that so you could have the full benefit of my slides. So with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen. This last URL and QR code is to get to our economic report if you wanted to go back and see um, more of the detail about the data. So I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much. So we're going Wonderful. to be taking questions now. So. Uh, um, John, if you want to take it away. Uh, could you go more in detail about how you calculated um, efficiency loss with regards to um, presentation? Um, actually, that's a great question. And what I'd like to do is refer you to the report because we have a whole section on efficiency losses in there that describes the method, uh, the sources for the method that we chose to do and then how that was calculated. It's definitely in the report. Yep. Thank you. All right, we'll take a question from Vanchit. Oh, hi, uh, so thank you for that. That was um, a really great presentation. Um, I, um, since you addressed the topic of um, diet pills, I was wondering if there's like an economic analysis angle um, that sort of explores um, the connection uh, between like the diet industry and uh, eating disorders. So like the money that goes into this industry and the huge amount of money generates and that compared with the uh, losses that we, uh, that we see through your study. So, yeah, excellent question. Right on, the, right on the money, as they say, that question. There's a, a lot of work uh, that actually you can find it in the business literature on how much money these industries make because they are all reporting that to each other, what they're making. The weight loss supplements alone in the United States in one year is a $2.5 billion industry. And that's billion with a B. That's only counting in the US in only one year. Globally, much bigger industry. These products are all over the world. We're actually in the process of doing a global policy scan of what the regulation looks like in countries all over the world because we know this industry is all over. Supplements in general are closer to $50 billion in the US in a single year. Globally, it's more like 250 billion, that's US dollars globally in that industry. The, um, the money coming in for marketing, all of that is huge. What we also, another part of your question there, uh, what we're also doing, we're just about to uh, send out a, a new study for publication in a journal, hopefully it'll be out in the next six months, estimating the cost of eating disorders attributable to use of these products and the harm caused by these products. So we've got new work coming out on that. And then another study you might be interested in that we published a couple of years ago, was uh, the, the um, is it a micro simulation modeling of if we had a tax on over the counter diet pills, what might a tax on diet pills do to use? So as you probably all know, cigarettes, tobacco is taxed in the US, that tax was added purposely to drive down use by consumers in general and youth because youth tend to be more price sensitive because you just don't have as much money as you know, a 50 year old has been working full time for a long time. So uh, taxes are used as a public health tool, as a lever. We did a micro simulation model using standard methods from economics to estimate how much we could drive down use with a hypothetical 20% tax on diet pills. If you wanna reach out to me later, I'm happy to share those other studies with you. Thanks for the great questions. All right, we're gonna have uh, Kushi if you want to take it away. Um, so I would like to say that it's just great to see how research can actually lead to policy action because one thing is that, you know, time and time again, research can say one thing, but that doesn't always lead to action. So it's quite nice to see that. 
Um, but I wanted to ask what the distribution of the cost is. So you looked more at like total costs, but is there like for the distribution of individuals with eating disorders, is there some percentage who have a very high cost or is it more evenly distributed? Ah, yeah, great. Uh, I definitely would recommend that you check out our report too, because we have it broken down in much more detail. Okay. Uh, th yeah. But yes, it, it, if you were looking at the individual level, uh, people end up uh, having to spend a lot more money for anorexia nervosa because it's a very, yeah. very serious condition uh, and um, can last for many years and can have more economic impacts on individuals. So, so uh, individuals with anorexia nervosa and their families will be paying more than those with other eating disorders. However, when you then take a population perspective as opposed to the individual's perspective, it's the more common eating disorders that actually cost the economy the most. So that was a point I was making about binge eating disorder and the other kind of catch-all category. Even though it's got a, a terrible name that's obtuse, it's not that it's not a serious condition. It's not less serious than ones that got their own name. I just wanna point that out. It's just peculiar with how psychiatrists name things. Uh, but the, there's a, it's very important to do what you're, you're pointing out here. The cost to individuals is, is, is crucial information, but it's different than the cost to populations or the societal level. We want to know both. So thanks for asking that question. All right, just Mia, and then for now, you guys can take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Austin, for this amazing lecture, especially since it's such a significant topic that really needs to be heard, especially by youth. And I was thinking about the correlation between like poverty levels, especially in America, and how this actually affects um, eating disorders among youth and families. Because um, I read some studies, including your paper in The Hill, how that there's barely any information in the CDC with guidelines about how to eliminate barriers to care. And uh, how would you say is the best like policy to implement in order to prevent um, eating disorders um, from coming up in families that are struggling, like low income families, those who are experiencing poverty, since there's such a rise, especially with the pandemic? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And it's such an important issue that you're raising. And so few people know this. So I'm glad you're raising it now. The, the, during the pandemic, I'll take a step back to talk a little bit about this, uh, how this arose during the pandemic. As you may have read in headlines, or maybe you're closer to it and, and have seen this happen, uh, that food insecurity, as they call it, or nutrition insecurity, was, was a big issue, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. It already was an issue. And there's, there's uh, just terrible uh, disparities or inequities across communities where we see before the pandemic, we had a lot more uh, food insecurity affecting black and brown communities, immigrant communities already, because even though this, the US is a wealthy nation, the food systems are not set up to make sure food is equitably accessible. Well, food insecurity causes enormous stress on families and on individuals, psychological stress, financial stress, physical stress. Uh, and then the pandemic escalated that. Uh, what we know from other research is that food insecurity increases the risk of developing an eating disorder. So with the pandemic, what was already a problem, not well recognized, just came right out into the fore. We see skyrocketing rates of eating disorders. We saw, especially in the first half of the pandemic, um, skyrocketing rates of food insecurity. Some of that has been addressed, but the underlying problems with our food system and the economic inequalities of access to nutritious food all month, not just at the beginning of the month, but it, it, when uh, maybe some uh, federal assistance is available, but we want people to have access to nutritious foods all the month. That's going to be a problem after the pandemic. It's much worse, um, as uh, Tazmia had pointed out, much worse during the pandemic. Now, you had asked for solutions. That is a, you raised a very complicated problem. I think one of the things we need is that the, the parts of our society, of advocates, of government, folks who are focused on addressing our uh, unequal food systems and food inequality, they need to be more educated about eating disorders and the mental health effects of living under those conditions. For the most part, they don't know anything. If you had a meeting with them and you said, hey, look, here's a study showing food insecurity is linked, is, uh, they increases the risk of eating disorders, and then you have compounding mental health struggles on individuals and families, that would be news to them. They need to know that so that they can work in partnership. Uh, we could talk a long time more about that, but I, thank you for raising that question. Thank you.
Hi, yeah, thank you so much for a great lecture again. Um, I wanted to ask about um, how, if, if you've seen that in these other countries that are developing um, and countries that are, especially the ones that are suddenly rising and coming to these middle income brackets, for example, have you seen that these countries are also seeing a major increase in these eating disorders prevalence as their income level rises and potentially they become similar towards these Western countries? Are you seeing that this effect that we've looked at in the United States is something that's more global in these developing nations? Yeah, we thank you for that. We do see eating disorders around the globe and we, we do see different rates, but we're also seeing increasing rates, as you pointed out. We see high rates of eating disorders in Asia, and that includes South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, high rates in the Middle East. Uh, the eating disorder, the, the someone had asked a question about distribution. Um, the distribution from an epidemiologic perspective differs for some eating disorders and differs by gender in some of these, in the different cultural settings uh, where we're seeing more, like for instance, some of the newer research from Asia, including South Asia uh, and East and Southeast Asia, we're seeing more similar rates of eating disorders in men and women or boys and girls. Um, I haven't seen research on transgender or gender non-binary in Asia yet, but I'm sure people are doing it, but we're seeing more gender, gender, gender equality uh, than we have seen in the US or Western Europe. Uh, but we're, and we're also seeing more binge eating in some areas, like in the Middle East, for instance, we're seeing a lot of binge eating um, disorder. So this is a mental health condition uh, and people need to have access to treatment. Um, so yes, it's all over and we need folks, uh, there are folks working on the ground in many countries and we need a lot more of that happening. For sure, thank you. All right, thank you so much. So our final question, we'll show Reha Warner, if you take it away. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I live in Australia and I've heard so much about the Butterfly Organization oh. since it's such a prominent organization over here. And it's really amazing the impact and support the organization gives over here, especially for youth. And I was wondering what steps do you think need to be taken in order to establish an organization like Butterfly in the US? And do you think Australia is so advanced comparably because of like the public perception of organizations such as Butterfly over here? Ah, yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you know all about Butterfly. They're tremendous. They're world leaders. Uh, so we do have organizations like that in the U.S. And um, that I would, we have the National Eating Disorders Association. We have the Eating Disorders Coalition, which is a federal advocacy group. And there's others, the Alliance. There's really excellent organizations. I think what, there's probably a couple reasons why um, the U.S. was quite a bit behind, but that we did finally follow Australia's lead. One reason is there, there were just a, some incredible change makers with Butterfly who knew enough and had some access to funds to be able to make that study happen. They were people who were big thinkers, really uh, effective at taking ideas that were nobody else had thought of and translating it into the eating disorders community. So I wanna give credit to the, to the group of people who thought of it and made it happen. And that can happen anywhere where you could have real real visionary leaders step up and then they change the game for everybody and we're thankful to that another piece though is that the healthcare system in the u.s if, if there was any one word that could describe it i would say it is cacophony it is such a chaotic system so many different payers so many different ways that people get covered it depends on what city you're in what state whether it's rural what condition you have who the insurer is how old you are all there's so many differences and there's no central repository for the data the there uh, there is no one place not like australia not like canada Western Europe in different countries there where there's a central repository for health data or health systems data. The US is just chaos in terms of that. That made it a harder struggle to try to figure out how to do that. Uh, but if, so we have it in the US, just the Australians I think are, uh, were able to more efficiently move forward to the credit of the folks who thought of it 10 years ago.